Hi, welcome back. In this set of slides, we'll look at building a responsive website using the Twitter Bootstrap framework. We'll talk about what is Bootstrap, why we might want to use it, how we can get started and up and running quickly, and then we'll discuss some of the features of Bootstrap, such as its CSS grid system, content styles available, components, and also the JavaScript plugins that they give you. We'll also talk about how to customize Bootstrap and best practices for using it. So what is Bootstrap? Well, Bootstrap was originally created as a style guide so that the people working at Twitter could create internal websites quickly and easily for their company. The idea was that by providing HTML templates, CSS, and JavaScript files that were pre-written for their developers to use, they could quickly build web pages without having to spend a lot of time worrying about style and functionality. As it turns out, this ended up being a pretty useful tool for the general public as well. As of this recording, we're currently on the third version of Bootstrap, and it's come a long way since its beginning. Essentially, Bootstrap is an HTML, CSS, and JavaScript framework for developing responsive mobile-first projects on the web. So why might you want to use Bootstrap? Well, one of the advantages, as mentioned previously, is that it provides the ability to build responsive sites. So it has pre-written CSS media query code that allow you to easily and efficiently scale your websites and applications. And that's going to ensure that your web pages you build with Bootstrap are going to work on phones and tablets as well as desktops and larger screens. Bootstrap also comes with a ton of features. So you get extensive and beautiful documentation for common HTML elements, dozens of custom HTML and CSS components, as well as some awesome jQuery plugins that are baked right in. Bootstrap also allows flexible styling. So it ships with vanilla CSS, but its source code utilizes the two most popular CSS preprocessors, Less and Sass. Bootstrap is also very popular. So there's millions of sites across the web that are being built and maintained with Bootstrap. This means a community of people using it, and this increases the likelihood for sharing themes and also troubleshooting any issues you might have. Also, it's open source. It's hosted, developed, and maintained on GitHub, which means it's easy to submit issues and you have a whole community of people providing pull requests and updates all the time. One of the number one reasons why a lot of developers like to use Bootstrap is you can build very quickly. So as opposed to spending the time to write out your own CSS grid systems, or write out all of the CSS styles for your website, you can quickly make use of all of the pre-written code that's provided for you, available via download. And this way there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So you might be wondering, are there any drawbacks to using Bootstrap or other such front-end frameworks? Well, one of the common criticisms is individuality. So many sites do not tend to customize their styles beyond the vanilla default bootstrap styling, and this ends up making hundreds of sites that end up looking kind of the same. Another drawback is, unless you go into the less or the SAS source code for the styles and set your own custom breakpoints, you're most likely just downloading bootstrap and using the pre-compiled CSS, which sets the breakpoints for you. This means that it doesn't allow for your content to determine when media queries trigger, but rather you're relying on Bootstrap's custom breakpoint settings. So what I mean is that whatever Bootstrap has decided is the size at which your content should shift from maybe a multi-column layout to a single column layout is already a predetermined set of pixels. And unless you go in and customize this yourself and you just use the de facto Bootstrap settings, it's possible that this may not look good on varying size devices depending on your own unique content. Another common criticism of Bootstrap and similar frameworks is that people say they're heavier than necessary, meaning that they carry a large file size for the advantages. Um, so if you're not using all the features, then the file size could be potentially heavier than if you had written your own custom code. Without further ado, let's talk about getting started using Twitter Bootstrap. So the official project site for Bootstrap is at http colon slash slash getbootstrap.com and you can visit it on GitHub as well at github.com slash twbs slash bootstrap. Upon visiting getbootstrap.com, you'll notice that there are several download choices. The first download choice is to simply download the compiled and minified CSS, JavaScript, and fonts without any of the docs or original source files. 
This is a reasonable solution if you're interested to just get up and running quickly and you're not interested in heavily customizing Bootstrap. However, if you are interested in customizing Bootstrap, you're also provided with two other options for downloads, one being the less version, which includes the source less files, JavaScript, and font files, along with all of Bootstrap's documentation. Now this does require a less compiler in order to compile the less files down into CSS after you edit them and does require some setup on your computer. Additionally, there's another version that is bootstrap ported from less to SAS. And this is helpful if you're trying to include it in a Rails project or any Ruby based project where you're using Compass or other SAS only frameworks. You can also link to Bootstrap using a CDN or content delivery network. The most common place people link to Bootstrap from is the www.bootstrapcdn.com. Bootstrap is also shared on cdnjs.com under library slash twitter dash bootstrap. When downloading the compiled and minified version of Bootstrap, you get a zip file. And when you double click on the zip file to extract it, out pops a folder structure that looks something like this. So we have this parent level folder, the root folder here called Bootstrap, and inside of it we have three folders, CSS, JavaScript, and fonts. Inside the CSS folder we have bootstrap.css, which is the uncompressed compiled CSS, and then underneath that we have bootstrap.min.css, which is the minified version of that CSS, so that's a slightly smaller file size. Although you get a smaller file size with the minified version, um, it does destroy the readability of the file, so it isn't too easy at that point to make any adjustments or changes once it's minified. We also have the bootstrap theme and the bootstrap theme.min, which is the minified version of the bootstrap theme. In the JavaScript folder, we have bootstrap.js and the minified version of it, bootstrap.min.js. This will include all of the JavaScript code necessary for all of the rich user interface behavior and all of the jQuery plugin code that's been added to this framework. And lastly, we have a fonts folder that includes the glyph icon halflings regular, and this is provided in all of the different common web font file types so that it should work in just about any browser. After downloading the zip file, you're going to want to change the name of the bootstrap folder to a name that will suit your own website project. So here I've just renamed the bootstrap folder to my-site-project. But for example, if we were building a website for Stanley's used furniture, we might want to change the name to Stanley's-used-furniture site. The next thing you're going to do is create an index.html page inside of your project's root folder. So that will sit outside the CSS, JavaScript, and fonts folder as indicated in this slide. The next thing you're going to want to do is open up your index.html file inside of your project. And you're going to want to set up the markup structure of a basic bootstrap HTML document. Now you can go ahead and copy and paste it from getbootstrap.com slash getting dash started slash hashtag template. You can see this is just a basic HTML5 template. It starts with a doc type, HTML in the upper left hand corner. The HTML tag has an attribute lang set to English, and you can see it includes the HTML head and body sections as well. Inside of the HTML head section, we have the meta character set set to UTF-8. We also have something called the HTTP equivalent set to XUA compatible, and content set to IE Edge, and this will help for supporting Internet Explorer browsers. We also have the meta name viewport tag which has its content set to device width and initial scale equal to one. And underneath that here, we see the title tag, which you can change to be the title of your project. So in the case of Stanley's used furniture, we would write Stanley's used furniture for the title there. And you can see that there is following the title, a link tag, which is linking to the CSS file for bootstrap, which is in the CSS folder. So here we have the href pointing to css slash bootstrap.min.css. Under that we have a quick if conditional that's only meant for browsers that are less than Internet Explorer 9. Um, essentially this is going to add the ability of uh, responsive media queries and also the HTML5 elements will be now visible and usable in browsers um, of Internet Explorer 8 or below. Now inside the body section now we just have an h1 that says hello world 
and obviously you could replace that with your own HTML content. And below that we have two JavaScript tags, and here we have one pointing to the Google CDN shared copy of jQuery. And then below that we are linking to the bootstrap minified JavaScript file which is in the JS folder. So here you can see the script source is pointing to js slash bootstrap.min.js. Now that our HTML page is linked to the bootstrap.css and the bootstrap.js, now we're free to play with the framework and add in all of the great functionality and features that Bootstrap provides.